Hello, and thank you for joining this Onc Live peer exchange titled Track Inhibitors, Precision Medicine and Oncology. Track inhibitors represent a significant leap forward for oncology precision medicine, providing remarkable efficacy with this first FDA approved tumor agnostic therapy for malignancies harboring intract gene fusions. Challenges remain, however, in screening for this rare genomic entity to determine which patients should be considered for this novel therapy. In this Onc Live peer exchange discussion, I am joined by a panel of experts with experience in this area. Together, we will guide you through the practical considerations surrounding the use of TRAC inhibitors. I'm Dr. Benjamin Levy, an Associate Professor of Oncology for Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and Clinical Director of Medical Oncology for the Johns Hopkins Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center at Sibley Memorial Hospital in Washington, D.C. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Mark Agalnik, Professor of Medicine, Division of Hematology Oncology, and Head of the Sarcoma Program at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Marsha Bros, Associate Professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the Director of the Thyroid Cancer Therapeutics Program and the Director of the Center for Rare Cancers and Personalized Therapy for the Abramson Cancer Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Edward Kim, Chair of Department of Solid Tumor Oncology and Investigational Therapeutics, and the Donald S. Kim Distinguished Chair for Cancer Research, Levine Cancer Institute, Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. Dr. John Marshall, Director for Clinical Care of the Roosh Center for Cure for GI Cancers at the Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, D.C., and Chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C. And Dr. Philip Phillip. Professor of Oncology and leader of the Gastrointestinal and Neuroendocrine Multidisciplinary Team at the Barbara Ann Carmanos Cancer Center in Detroit, Michigan. Thank you so much for joining us and let's begin. So I think we've all been assembled here today as, as somewhat of a, a sign of how far we've moved in personalized medicine. Um, uh, you know, I think this is predicated on the fact that we now have a more firm understanding, at least a genomic uh, of the genomic underpinnings of a tumor that allow us to uh, wed uh, uh, these patients to targeted therapies that are effective. Um, but this has created a tremendous amount of excitement and at the same time I think a little confusion um, uh, embedded into all this. So uh, John, I'll start with you uh, as the senior statesman of the panel. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that. Um, and maybe you can provide for us some historical context, perspective of precision medicine, where we were, where we are uh, uh, currently in the field for solid tumor malignancies. Yeah, thanks, Ben. You know, when you reflect back, and as old as I am, old as dirt, you know, the only molecular test we really did, I think, when I was a fellow many years ago was, I think, ERPR uh, for breast cancer. And if you think about where we've come to where I, there are almost no solid tumors, at least, and I think the same is true for hematologic malignancies, where H&E is enough. Right? We're not just that everything's an adenocarcinoma. Um, it needs to be further characterized by its molecular subtype. And so we've evolved from no molecular testing to what is sort of oligo or you know, a la carte testing, where you've got clear abnormalities uh, for specific diseases, where we have clear evidence and clinical utility, so the sort of short list of genes and molecular tests to now where we are doing much, much broader testing in the hopes of finding unusual, unusual targetable uh, abnormalities. And so this transformation we've seen over the last five to 10 years has really transformed our standard of care. And I think the reason we're all gathered here is in some way a celebration of that breakthrough away from where the disease started to now a place where we're measuring the molecular underbellies of all of our tumors. Yeah, I, I, I've said this before. I went into lung cancer 10, 15 years ago because it was easy. Mm -hmm. It was just several chemotherapy drugs and maybe anti-angiogenesis, and we call it a day, and I agree with you. Um, the last 10, 15 years have witnessed unprecedented advances in our understanding of this. 
uh, that really have allowed us to parse things out uh, into uh, these molecular subsets and then offering patients therapies that uh, we could not before. Um, uh, this has impacted on trial design as we've moved forward um, in terms of how we design our clinical trials around these molecular underpinnings. Um, Ed, you want to talk about some of your involvement uh, and, and, and maybe provide some context on how these trials are changing globally and some of your involvement with the battle trial uh, as one of the first trials out there in lung that was really onto this concept of biomarker-driven therapies. Yeah, we were, uh, we were very frustrated with how the field was going, uh, comparing uh, really cytotoxic chemotherapy versus other cytotoxic chemotherapies and looking for slivers of differences between those regimens. And we, we felt uh, at the time, back in 2006, that something had to change. We, we didn't need another taxane or another platinum or another vinca. So uh, we thought, why don't we biopsy people again? And uh, surprisingly, a lot of backlash about that. Like we wanted to re-biopsy people who had been diagnosed already. And it was unbelievable how much people inside the system, other colleagues said, well, that's unethical. How can you put patients through that? Uh, we tried to be as safe as we could with the patients. Uh, we found oral therapies that were targeted agents at the time. Uh, many of them had multiple targets. Uh, and we, we called it a step toward personalizing medicine. We, weren't, we knew we weren't going to solve this. People confused battle. It wasn't a phase three randomized design. It was a phase two pilot with using a Bayesian adaptive randomization uh, profile. And uh, it, it was actually a really fun trial, a lot of work but a fun trial to do. And the reason it was fun was we enrolled 254 patients on that study yeah. in less than three years. A lot of enthusiasm from both physician and patients. Right, and, yeah. and the patients wanted to be part of it because they are inherently altruistic. If it can't help them, they want to help their next patient down the road. And that's what this trial did. It learned from every patient. And so the beauty was we were able to collect tissue, collect blood, this was at the time of when you were going to treat someone, not the archive tissue from two years ago, three years ago, that now the tumor has been exposed to multiple lines of chemo. And, and so I think what we've learned is, as we've become more accustomed to integrating a biomarker approach, active drugs are just that, active. You're not going to look for subtle signals when you're looking for actual targeted therapy. And the days of these subtle responses or what have you, especially in biomarker-directed populations, are no longer. Those drugs should not be approved. We need to have a higher standard. We need to put active drugs out there. You know it when it works. And that's why you don't need these randomized phase threes anymore. You can do a phase one, one B expansion cohort, as we've seen with drugs we'll talk about today, 50, 60 patients. And when that response rate hits 50 to 75 percent, you know it's working. Yeah. So the, the paradigm change in the clinical trials uh, predicated on these biomarkers has also shifted what the metric is for getting these drugs approved. I would agree that the, the days of the phase two, three in trials I don't think are gone, but I think they're slowly getting replaced. Uh, with, with these types of trials that we'll talk about in terms of uh, basket trials or umbrella trials.